Today we're talking with someone who has both a physical research component as well as a computational research component, and he's a teacher in both the undergraduate levels and the graduate levels. So it's gonna be a really fun interview. Stay tuned and get some popcorn because it's gonna be a really good time. Dr. Sideros, how are you doing? Thank you for, uh, for taking the time to, uh, to talk with me today. Of course, it's my pleasure. My name is Konstantin Sideros. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at USC, which is part of Viterbi. I actually joined USC not too long ago, uh, which uh, might be why you haven't taken a class from me. I joined uh, back in August 2018. I did all of my degrees at Caltech, uh, so which is in, in Pasadena, even a short stint as a postdoc at Caltech before I uh, joined USC as an assistant professor. Uh, now at USC, I actually uh, do research in both areas. Um, and so uh, actually half of my group is working on integrated circuits and they're sort of what I call the experimental side of my group and the other half uh, is working on computational methods for electromagnetics. I teach an undergraduate course uh, one semester in the fall and I teach a graduate level course in the spring. A couple uh, BME undergrads doing research in my group, which in the spring I teach a course on computational electromagnetics essentially. So it's related mm -hmm. to my research. Our current primary research interests in the biomedical space, uh, the majority of them um, are uh, point of care uh, biosensor. Yeah, no, that, that's really cool. And, and just from talking with you, you seem to be someone who is uh, very, very passionate and very excited about, about what you do. So coming from this you know, perspective of the past, what is it, eight or nine months, we've been under sort of quarantine orders and sort of, you know, stay at home and try to be as separate as, from others as possible. How has it been uh, for you sort of when you first heard about the quarantine lockdown? Like, how has that been managing a lab and, and sort of learning to cope with this new situation we find ourselves in? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's been difficult to some extent for everybody, regardless of whether it's the, it's a computational lab or it's an experimental lab. I think it's likely been the most difficult for the, the students themselves as well, especially during the lockdown. We weren't allowed to go on campus at all during a, a specific time period. That was the most difficult for people that did experimental only work. In our specific case, it was definitely bad timing with the experimental side of things because uh, my lab renovation just completed a couple weeks before the lockdown happened. And so we were in the process of starting to unbox equipment and we were excited that the lab was finally done and ready to be used. Um, and then for good reason, but they were like, yeah, it's not safe right now. Not, nobody can go into the lab for a while until we say that it's safe. And so that was definitely very disappointing from that aspect. I think everybody's morale was kind of down for a while and sort of it's, it's definitely picked back up now. You know, for example, my graduate students all share an office space together and they're used to basically, you know, being able to talk to each other and interact with each other. They would often go to lunch together and stuff. And going from that to where you're basically isolated on your own, it's very demotivating, you know, from a personal standpoint. And so I, I think, you know, regardless of whether you're doing computational work or experimental work, you know, even if you're doing computational work, when you are told you can't leave your house anymore, I think it's just difficult for everybody. Since the beginning, I set up a Slack group for my research group. Yeah. Um, and it's really convenient because it just like, you know, not just for me to communicate with my students, but also now that they're all separate, like they have their own like, you know, channels and they can talk to each other and stuff mm -hmm. and like they can message each other. And so it's private between them. So it's not like I see what they're talking about. So they can, right. you know, they can talk about me, they can talk about whatever they want. It doesn't <laughs> like, um, and so yeah. it, while obviously it's not the same thing, it does recover a small bit of the social aspect essentially that Definitely. we're missing out on by not seeing each other in person. For me, I guess it would be like, you know, half and half. I'm, I'm thankful, I'm very thankful that I do have a computational side because I think it would be a lot more frustrating for, for us if we were completely experimental and we had no way to do research in the group, especially given the fact that our lab renovation had just finished and mm -hmm. it was basically like, they're like, here's your brand new lab. And then like a couple of weeks later, it was like, never mind, you can't go in it yet. Um, right. I think initially everybody was hoping that this would be like, you know, one, two, maybe three months or so and the world would return back to normal. <laughs> but I think now it's become very clear that that's not going to be happening anytime soon. Right. Um, and, and so uh, we've all had to find ways to adapt to 
you know, continue on with our research and, and our work in whatever way that we can, the most efficient way possible. Well, how would you say that your lab or maybe yourself has dealt with that transition? That this is probably not going to go anywhere anytime within the next few months, maybe if we get lucky in the next like six months, but if we get lucky. Yeah, <laughs> but if we get lucky, right? Yeah. Um, my, my wife and I used to share an office, so we would have like, you no know, two desks in the same room. She always uses the home office, but I would work the, my office at USC for the most part before the, the lockdown and the pandemic happened. My wife's uh, coworkers were basically starting to learn circuits because as you may have noticed, I'm very loud. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> it was like, you know, it only lasted about like a week or so uh, before we converted the guest room into another office. And yeah. so now we have kind of like separate offices. And so my, my students have, uh, most of them live around USC campus. They have housemates and, and roommates. So I, I think that they've like not been completely alone, um, which I think is probably like, it would be the worst. I, I think if you're just completely isolated on your own and you have you know, nobody, not even family or friends or anything like that. All of my students are international. Typically uh, would be going home to visit their families over the summer for, for vacation, for example. And, you know, that is out of the picture now. They haven't been able to go home since they got here in, you know, yeah. last last fall. Um, and so I think that is, is likely extra difficult for them. The fact that they can't go and visit their families. They can, but there's like a, you know, a big risk in terms of like, you know, uh, and so they, they haven't done so. Because that's, um, that's not just the health at that point. That's also like there's immigration policies that are making it very difficult. They don't know if they'll be able to re-enter the country if they leave. Especially if they have like a single entry visa, for example, then right. they would have to like reapply for a visa. And a lot of the immigration offices these days are either completely closed or they're operating like at a very small percentage of the capacity that they normally are. Some countries also have strict quarantine rules where you might have to quarantine for, for two weeks, for example, or three weeks. And, and so if you're planning on going to visit your parents and like you're planning on going for three weeks total, for example, or even a month, and you have to spend half of that in quarantine, it makes you think twice in terms of like, you know, whether that's worth it and whether it's worth, like you said, taking an added health risk. On sort of that topic, or trying to move to a more, I guess, a, a nicer topic, or I guess as nice as we can be, mm -hmm. looking to the future. So at, at USC, the spring semester, they've announced it will be like hybrid, which mm -hmm. means that it's likely until further notice going to be online. What would you recommend for students who are um, doing research moving forward into the spring semester and to however long um, the situation lasts for us? It's important to try to stay motivated and to try to stay as confident as possible. Um, and so there is going to be light at the end of the tunnel. At the same time, it's important to not get complacent and to adhere to all like the safety protocols that uh, are necessary and that USC is requiring for doing research so that we can keep on doing research. Right now we've gone back to 50% capacity uh, research-wise in, in terms of experimental research. In terms of actual cases on campus, we have very, very few cases. And I think that's largely because of the safety precautions involved. I think that it's not going to be as hard in the spring because now we've kind of gotten used to this mode of operation. USC students are, uh, are, are very, uh, creative and they're they're very like capable of adapting to difficult situations just like how if you have a difficult research problem that you don't know how to solve you're going to like keep at it and keep like you know chipping away at it until you find a solution i think it's like a similar sort of mindset of like you know the tenacity that you you need to have as as a graduate student so from seeing my students and talking with them it seems like they're doing a lot better these days in terms of like being able to cope with the current situation, being able to navigate around things. Um, you know, they're experts with a Trojan check now whenever they need to get on campus. They're like, oh yeah, I've got this, no problem. Switching over to the teaching aspect. Um, I, I initially expected that, you know, teaching over Zoom, teaching online would be like really difficult. Like it would be a way, way worse experience than teaching in person. Um, I definitely think that teaching in person is better and is more effective. And I think that it's being in a class together and being able to, to interact with the faculty and participate and being in the same physical room. But at the same time, it actually has turned out to be a lot better than I thought it was. And there are also some distinct advantages. I do think that, you know, it has been effective. And I, I think that, you know, 
despite the fact that there are definitely many advantages and positives to having an in-person teaching style and when it's safe i think you know everybody's going to look forward to you know being back together in the classroom it works essentially and i don't know what your experience if you've taken any classes online we we felt that the lab component was a very important part of the class because it kind of brings the circuit theory aspect it, it turns it into reality where the student can actually build the circuits on a breadboard and then like look at look at the outputs on an oscilloscope and verify that hey the, actually all the stuff we've been talking about in class right. it's not just math it's physics it, it makes actually sense. applies and it, yeah and it makes sense and it works um, and so we absolutely wanted to keep that. We didn't want to get rid of the lab aspect. We uh, were able to find these uh, portable sort of USB operated modules mm -hmm. that um, that essentially have a built in power supply, function generator, uh, oscilloscope and network analyzer. So it's kind of like an all in one type of system um, that we uh, that USC uh, purchased a bunch of them and they mailed them out to the students. The other difficult aspect uh, for the TAs was conducting lab office hours online um, because I remember those circuits took a long time because like there's yeah. always be, like that <laughs> one component doesn't work or like they're just they just miss it by one hole exactly it's it's like you know circuits can be finicky and, and breadboards and it could for example it could just be that like the the breadboard is worn out so when you mm -hmm. plug in the component or the wire into the hole it doesn't make good contact with the conductors in the breadboard and then you have to like try it somewhere else or with a different uh, a component like you mentioned um, and so that's a lot easier for a TA to, if they're physically there, to look at the board and then try things and be able to do things. It, it definitely requires more communication in terms of figuring out what's wrong and debugging. But at the same time, you can look at it as a cup half full mentality in terms of it also prevents the TAs from doing the lab for the student. TA can sometimes get frustrated and be like, oh, it's clear that you did this, this, and this wrong, and they just changed all the wires and then it works, yeah. but the student didn't learn how to do it themselves. But now the, the TA can't physically reach through the screen, obviously, and, and change things. And so the student has to understand why what they're doing isn't working and fix it themselves, which you know might be, is definitely more frustrating throughout the process, but it is more rewarding. And I think they get more of a learning experience uh, as an outcome. The first few weeks, like the lab attendance was actually not that high because students were like, hey, I've got all the stuff, I can just do it myself. Ah, but then they realized mm, that it was hard. Not for <laughs> 202. They were, like, <laughs> they were sending emails like, this lab isn't working, what am I doing? I'm like, did you attend the lab office hours? Like the specific lab section? And they're like, no. And I'm like, why not? <laughs> and they're like, oh, like I thought I could do it whenever I wanted. I'm like, you can. But that's an extra added degree of freedom that we give for you because you have the lab physically with you at all times versus in person, you would have to physically be in the actual classroom to do it. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's an extra degree of freedom that you have. But at the same time, you should still go to the lab session because the TA introduces it and they can help you debug it and understand what's going wrong if you don't know. For sure. Yeah, I was going to actually wrap up by asking you, what are lessons that we can take from this time that you think would really change the way that we do classes and that we even work um, moving into the future. But I think you you seem to have a, very, a kind of a positive outlook uh, onto what this can bring. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, like the online setting, I think it's I, I think it's very useful to have that. I mean, it would be interesting to consider a modality where more classes get offered online or in a hybrid setting where they're when it's, where it's safe to go back in person you still offer potentially an online or you offer a recording of the lecture afterwards potentially you do some office hours you can do online or there are definitely aspects of the the, the teaching online that we can use to our advantage that it, that can improve the 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 quality of education using resources like blackboard more you know uploading the homework uh, online, like as a, as a PDF mm -hmm. rather than printing it out and like having to turn in a hard copy that saves a lot of time. It also saves a lot of paper. Um, so which, you know, is good for yeah. the environment. Some students still do it, turn it on paper and some students for their exams, like, you know, we gave them the option. You could do it on paper and take a photo with your phone, for example, and upload it, mm -hmm. or you can do it on an iPad or some sort of tablet. And so it's, it's interesting to think of like, which industries or which products like rather than suffered from the pandemic have actually benefited from it and i think the tablet industry is one of those like oh, for sure. uh, markets that's probably been doing really really well especially in the education sector when i first started writing stuff on a tablet i was like this doesn't feel right like i like <laughs> writing my notes on a sheet of paper yeah um, and, it still doesn't feel right time, to me. <laughs> 
it still doesn't feel right. Yeah. yeah, I think with time you kind of get used to it, but like you know, I agree that you don't get the same sort of like you know feedback response of mm. like writing um, on a sheet of paper. Um, the main advantage of of writing my own notes and stuff on a tablet is that I can just organize them digitally a lot more easily. Last question, but aside mm -hmm. from your wife and you sharing an office, what has been the most interesting quarantine story that has happened in the past nine months? Or quarantine hobby, if you've been working on any hobbies in, I don't know, have you found more free time? <laughs> I do not have much free time. <laughs> Actually, you know, um, I the weekends often feel the same as the weekdays, so I end up uh -huh. also like, you know, carrying over a lot of my work to the weekends yeah. sometimes. Um, and so I, I, unfortunately, I'm also at the assistant professor level, um, which uh, means that I do not have much free time, unfortunately. One thing that actually has been nice is that uh, both my wife's parents and my parents, they live uh, local. They live fairly close to, to us. Mm -hmm. On one day we visit my wife's parents and on the other day we visit my parents on the weekend. I think that's really nice because we get more family time. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the past, I feel like you kind of we often would take things for granted and we wouldn't you know necessarily see them as often um and they're really happy to see us because like we're the only people that they see essentially right, so right. um we spend time with family we like any, any free time that we have we'll you know watch movies at home or um but i, I guess you know typical things that that people would do that are not super interesting or exciting <laughs> per se but hey i mean um, we we we've got is, the we've got the time for it now Thank you so much for taking the time to, to, to chat with me. This was really fun. Of course. It was great meeting you. Um, I, I, I hope we stay in touch, and I hope you have an awesome weekend. Definitely. You too. Have a good one. Take care, Victor. Bye-bye. See ya. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give us a like and a comment, maybe even a subscribe if you really want to see more. Uh, speaking of more, you can check out some videos around here. I don't really know where they're going yet, but they will be there, including one by Dr. Brent Liu, who actually has a very different perspective than uh, Dr. Sideris about the whole pandemic and what this will bring for the future. We hope you're all doing safe and you are doing well, staying safe and doing well. Wow, I can't speak, but we'll see if we fix that next time.